Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R, and today we're going to paint the koala that we drew and inked, or I drew and inked, I should be honest about that last week. What we're going to do, I'm going to move this a little bit more into shot, I'm using, this is Scotch Magic Tape, um, to tape down the piece to, um, it's a little bit too far in. I'm going to do it about an eighth of an inch from the edge. Onto the back side of, this is a canvas board. Canvas boards are cheap, and they've got a rigid, rigid um, chipboard su substructure. So you can use them over and over again. You can tell I've used this one over many times. I have a lot of them. Um, but they're cheap. They're, they run about a couple of bucks, and they're durable. And... The Scotch Magic Tape is waterproof, and you basically you can burnish this down with your finger. I'm going to go over it again with um, something that's got a smooth edge to burnish the uh, tape down on the board. And the reason why I'm not being, you know, terribly careful about the edges because I'm not going to have any square edges. My edges are going to be a vignette, which means it's going to be like an opened-edged Piece. But the reason why I'm taping this down is because when you add water to any paper, even though this is 150 pound or 30, excuse me, 300 gram watercolor paper, it's going to buckle. It'll buckle a little bit no matter what. But if you stretch it first, what happens is when it dries, the fibers will flatten out. So that's why you want, and I'm going to use, this is the edge of a you can use the edge of a pen or um, anything that's smooth just to burnish down the tape so it doesn't pull up. You can see right now that I didn't press that down hard enough so that it will press down there and it'll hold your paper to the board. And because this is Scotch Magic Tape, it also peels up really nicely. I do not like gum tapes. I do not like masking tape because... They do not hold as well, and um, this stuff peels up nicely, and it's waterproof. So those those three things make it uh, a good tape for taping down something of this size. If you're doing like a really big watercolor, there are different ways of handling this. But most of my watercolors never go above like nine by twelve. Now we're going to this particular drawing. If you saw in the last video, um, I did it from a black and white. Drawing. So what I'm doing here is I have Googled the word koala, and I've got all kinds of koalas to look at here for my color so that I can get the color right. And the reason why I'm putting them off to the side, um, it'd be nice if you could look at them. But again, um, i got a copyright problem. When I can use, you can use any photo you want as reference material, but if you are... Um, showing something on film like this. You want to be careful about um, infringing on somebody else's copyright. So I'm going to start with, um, I'm going to start a little bit with the background. And I'm going to take, this is a, uh, a Prussian blue here. And you'll notice my, um, my palette here is a little bit dirty. So what I'm going to do first actually is I'm going to clean my palette. Okay, so I've put some water down in the palette here. And I have, I always have paper towels handy. I use paper towels, trusty paper towel. And you just take your paper towel and clean the water, the, the um, your um, paint out of the pan like that. And that's it. That's how you clean a watercolor paint pan. Um, now this is a Cotman watercolor set. We've got um, 12, these are the original 12 colors that the set came with. Um... I believe there's uh, like a, um, this is a cad yellow medium, I think a cad yellow light, cad red, um, burnt sienna, alizarin crimson, a yellow ochre, um, a viridian green, a permanent green, um, Payne's gray, cobalt blue. I put black in here and um, take that back. This is um, burnt... Burnt Sienna? No, Burnt Sienna's here. That's another burnt brown. I'm not sure what it is, because this is my Elizabeth Crimson right here. 
Um, but anyways, the, the colors that come in a Coatman set. And I'm using this today again because it's easier for you to see what I'm doing um, on camera when I've got a nice small palette like this. And because I'm doing a very small piece, I don't need a lot of room for, for my colors. But we're going to start with the sky. And then I'm just going to use, this is a, a Prussian blue. And I'm taking, you know, I'm putting water in the tin or in the pan, letting it get into the, the paint. I'll scumble the paint a little bit, then I'll put it on the palette. And that's too thick. That's too much paint in there. So I'll grab a little bit more water and I'll add it to the paint. And I'll usually mix it up a little bit. Um, that equalizes out the glue and the pigment together. And I'm going to just put that in the area in the trees. And the technique I'm using here is primarily um, dry, or sorry, wet on dry. And I will do some wet into wet within like these little puddles that I create when we start getting into the fur. I might do it in the sky a little bit too. I'll see as I'm going along how, you know, this particular blue settles. I'm liking just the kind of the nice cotton candy blue here right now, that, that uh, lighter color. And you'll see that where, where the um, pigment sits in deeper, it of course is darker. And so if you don't want it too dark, you just basically can pull up the paint with your brush. And right now I'm using a, um, the size of the brush I'm using is about a number two. So it's a little bit larger than when I go into detail. I use I use everything um, on a small piece like this. I'll probably start out with a number two or three brush, and then I'll go usually use a zero for the rest of the piece. Um, I can I go down as far as um, there's a low Cornell brush that goes down to ten aught that I use a lot for detail work. I will I buy them in like packs of five. Because the low cornels are not, they're synthetic brushes and their tips don't um, hold up to my beatings. And I beat my brushes. I am very cool. Cruel and humane punishment to brushes. Now I'm doing this as a vignette. Excuse me for changing the subject here. But um, I'm doing this as a vignette. So I'm going to stipple the edges and give them kind of a dot treatment. Now you'll notice. I had a dry area here and a wet area here, and I'm getting a little bit of a spidering edge. So what I'm doing is I, I don't want a real line there, so I'm going in right now, and I'm stippling next to that, or putting dots, in order to keep that edge from happening. Now, sometimes those edges happen, and you can't do anything about them, or you don't want to do anything about them after the fact. It might end up being something that you like. Um and you want to leave it the way it is but um you can always you can't always fix it you can but for the most part you can if you get a heavy line of color in a place where you don't want it you can usually go back in with an exacto knife later and scrape it away um it just takes a little bit of practice sometimes there there are mistakes that you just can't do anything about i mean that line dried and there's nothing that's going to save it. And the thing is, is that you might know that and you might notice that, but somebody who's looking at your painting won't ever see it. So most of the time, the things that you're thinking, oh my God, that looks horrible. And nobody even notices it's there. Okay. You can see I've got a little bit of problems with stuff going on up in that area. And what I'll do, it's another reason why I stipple because you can you can decide where the unevenness is in your background by creating that stippling pattern in the first place. It's like if, if something didn't work out up here, I can come back in and stipple a few more dots in this area. Now this area is still wet, so I'm painting wet on wet, and you'll notice that the, the color just um, dissolves into the background. So you want to wait for it. You get... you have to learn when your paint is like right here this area is dry this area is wet and you start 
recognizing where that's happening and wherever you're got a dry area the color that you're working with will not expand into that area it'll the dots will stay there and so that way you look like it was you know even you can have an accident that can look intentional okay now i'm going to do the tree and the trees in his area and it'll make him stand out more or her to stand out more because uh the koala itself is totally gray um most of the trees that are on are a yellowish or yellow red so i'm gonna do a bit of an orange color to the bark and again you want to start out light and notice i got a, i pulled in a little bit of blue on that and that's okay It'll also it'll harmonize more if you get um, run into an area like there's there's some blue that run ran into the tree there. It'll harmonize the color of the the bark more as the painting goes on. There's a little yellow up right there. And with the, the um, hot press paper, the, the paint will sit more on top of the surface rather than if you use cold press, it soaks in more into the surface of the paper and it puddles more. So you have more areas of sparkly white. And I know that some um, watercolor artists like that to have that uh, little bit of sparkle white showing. But with this one, I'm going, I like the, um, the texture again for pen and ink. Like I said, it, you've got to try it. I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, which is best, which is worse. It's not a matter of, um, this one's better or this one's better. It's really a matter of your own taste. And I can tell you what I like and how something works for me, but that doesn't mean that it's going to work for you, or that's not going to mean that that's the way that you're going to want to paint. So always take everything that every art instructor gives you with a grain of salt, because the way you want to do it is the right way. There is no wrong way when it comes to, to painting or techniques. There's only this is one way and that's another way. So I can give you insight on how I do things, but that doesn't mean that that's going to be the way you're going to want to do things. And always take that into consideration when you're uh, doing your own paintings. Okay, that's the initial lay down for the tree. Now, the area that's in the sky is dried a little bit, so I can go into the leaves now. And the leaves on a eucalyptus tree or on this particular eucalyptus tree, run between a yellow-green to a blue-green. And I am going to pull out the permanent green primarily, and a little bit of the viridian. Problem with viridian green, I don't care who makes it, I don't know why it is, but it does not like to um, reconstitute real fast. So if you're working with a, a viridian green of any kind, you got to really scumble the paint into it a bit. Now I'm going to take a little bit of Prussian blue over here on this side for the darker. So I've got I've got a light, medium, and a dark green. And I'm going to bounce between those th three and probably throw in some yellow occasionally too. Now I just went outside the line there. On that side over there so I'm gonna take my paper towel and I'm just gonna pull the whole thing up and you can see there's still a little green there but that's okay I'm just gonna leave it it's not like it's going to show terribly and also when I'm done I can also go over in that area and heavy up that line mm, still not liking that. or like I said if it's something that's really bothering me I can go in with an exacto knife later and scrape it off I think I'd like a little yellow in there, so a little yellow orange to make this a little bit lighter leaf. And 
The brush I'm using right now is a Winsor Newton Series 7, number 3. And this one's pretty dang old. Um, you can tell if, on the, the edge of the brush here that I always seem to, to wear the gold off of the uh, brushes before I change brushes. And that's one of the things I can say about Winsor Newton Series 7. Oh my lord, I beat my brushes. I'm really cruel to them. I do not... I do not take good care of my brushes. I am a cruel master when it comes to my brushage. But um, for being such a cruel master, um, the brush I'm painting with right now is probably anywhere from 15 to 20 years old. <laughs> this is the thing about... Um, yeah, it's probably not that old. It's probably just 10. Um, but the, the thing is, is that with um, Series 7 brushes, the Sable brushes, you pay for them, but... They're worth every penny. I cannot say enough. If you're going to paint in watercolor, at least get um, get one, number two, Winsor Newton Series 7 Sable Brush. Once you start using it, you'll go crutch. He was right. And you will, you will never, ever, ever want anything but Sable Brushes. There is something in the oil or the something the way that the sable grows its fur, that it makes it the best hair for a brush. And no synthetic brush can replace it. I'm sorry, I have tried tons of synthetic brushes because I have been, you know, in the pauper category when it comes to artists for quite some time. And you just will not find a synthetic brush that works as well as... A true sabled brush. Now you can see I, I've given little different bits of green in there. I'm going to go back in and get everything in a shadow after it's dry and then when I'm putting on the paint it's not one color blending into another. You have more of a solid age, edge. Okay now we're going to work a little bit on our koala mm. and we are definitely going to use black on this because I don't have any Payne's Gray on this palette. I think this is, I think I filled this with a Sienna. So I want this to be a little bit of a uh, blue gray. It's going to be a little bit warm gray. I'm going to take a little bit of extra blue in there. And you can get blacks naturally by just mixing um, blues and purples with um, greens and yellows. You know, the mud that you get will be a colored mud. Um, it won't be an exact black, which is okay. Because uh, supposedly, according to the pur purists, you are not supposed to be using black in your watercolor. Okay. I want this to go down relatively light. Now, he's got a white tummy, too. Let's see here. I want a little bit more blue in that black. It's a little bit too warm. There we go. And you can tell it's really a pretty transparent puddle. There's not a lot of um, paint or pigment in my color. And you can see his stomach is a cream color, so I'm leaving it white. And a little bit of the tips of his fingers. Now the blue came in there, but you can see that since it's gray, I'm just going to put the gray right over the top there. And... Um, koalas usually this this the lower lip is pink and the area around their eyes is white now if I find that that um, I've my painting has gotten too much into the eye area, I can always go again, go back in and pick out my color with an exacto knife blade. 
and you get into the habit of doing it after a while and nobody can tell that you've used an exacto knife blade on that paper because it's very good paper that's why you want to use at least 150 pound watercolor paper and most of the watercolor papers out there are um, at least 150 pound 300 gram and the, the only difference between you know the poundage and the grams is just the way we measure things it's the same way to paper Yeah, it went a little bit too far. See? It's able to pick it up. And usually you can do that as bits before it dries. Once it dries, you have to go back in with the uh, exacto knife blade. So we've got most of the base of the, this little guy down. Now we're going to start adding some color and some shadow. Um, I really want to add some shadow to the underside, and I'm going to use blue. I'm going to get the shadow on this particular tree is going to be to the blue side. And I do the same thing with the um, shadows that I, I did with the sky. I will stipple them a bit. And scumble them a bit to get some variety. Oh, that went out of bounds. Out of bounds. Out of bounds. There we go. And then he's got a shadow underneath his butt, underneath his foot. I'm also going to change my brushes. I'm still using a three. I'm going to go down to a zero. This is um, Winsor Newton Zero. Again, brush I've used for centuries. <laughs> not true. It's not quite that old, but they, they can last a good long time. I never thought that when I had an art instructor said, take good care of your brushes. They'll last you forever. And I'm like, nah, nah. And she was right and wrong. Uh, like I said, I am brutal my, to my brushes. If you were in the land of brushes, you wouldn't want Lynn as your master. You know. Okay, I'm going to put a little bit of this burnt sienna. I'm going to mix that into the brown. I'm going to start putting that little bit of burnt sienna into the shadows. Mixing that in with the blue. That's just because I want to warm things up a bit. That is gray, very cool. I don't want to keep it a little warmth in there. The side of his face over here. And right here in his ear, this is more gray. Pull that in there as well on the inside of the ear. Because you can't see the edge of the ear all that much, I'm going to cover that up too. Because the white really starts. It's all different, you know. That if you look at the the bears on the online, some of them. That, that area is white, some areas that's gray. Depends on the critter. Okay. And you can see I have a little bit of a, a line there. I'm gonna scumble the paint and I'll get rid of the line that I had there initially. And I'm going to take the gray on top over here and keep this white here because that's coming through underneath. I'm going to do just a little white there. And same thing to his tummy fur because even though 
I'm going to stipple it a little bit. Because it's white, but it's not pure white. Okay, now I'm going to take a little bit more of the burnt sienna. And you know, so I'm not worried about the fact that, you know, there's a little bit of darkness under there and there's some blue in there. And the thing is, is that I'm going to be using this for edging the, um, these kind of like, uh, bark puzzle pieces. So I don't really care too much about whether I got a little bit of blue in that, that brown, because it, it just adds to the color. It's like you wouldn't know that there was even blue in there because I'm painting on top of green, too. This is kind of like tinting when you, in the, um, before the days of, um, inexpensive color printing what they would do is they would print whole journals especially wildlife journals in black and white and then they would hire cheap labor quote unquote to tint the drawings because it was so much easier to just have pay somebody to tint the drawings than to tip in a color photograph nowadays it's it's the other way around Okay, now I'm going to take a little bit of that um, burnt sienna too. I'm going to use it as the shadow in my leaf. Um, I had a very good color instructor when I went to Art Center long ago and far away. Um, and her name was Judy Crook. And she was the one who always said, whenever color goes into its shadow, it adds its complement. So as green goes into shadow, it goes into red. So if you want a really rich shadow on your leaves, paint them with red. And um, that's technically what burnt sienna is. It's burnt sienna or ter terracotta is a very red brown. And it looks very nice for shading leaves, very organic. And I'm going to take a little bit of that burnt sienna and I'm going to stipple the shadows in our koala to do two things. One, to warm him up and to harmonize him with the rest of the painting so that he's not standing out there all along with this big blue-gray thumb. The little bits of red that I'm adding to his fur will make you feel like you've got a unit here where it's not just the koala sitting there. And the background's a little boring. So I'm going to take a little bit of green. Actually the blue-green. See if I can get it real light. And give the illusion of some something in the background because we are in a forest and that'll give some interest and some added color rather than just the uh, the blue in the background there And then I'm going to do one more little bit of, I'm going to do a line, or stipple down, yeah, stippling that would be good, that's a good idea. So a combination of lines and stipple down the back side of this branch. Actually, it's too thick there. Okay. Got a little bit too much burnt sienna on his wrist. We're just about done here. I'm 
you can see that gives a really nice interest. And yes, as I realize there's no green on our bark. Let's throw a little green on there. And the reason why you want to do that is it's a it's a harmonizing thing. It's it's that you don't feel like you've got one thing that's made out of orange just sticking out there in the middle of nowhere. So if you add a little bit of the background colors into what you're doing in the fore and mid-ground, it brings the whole painting together. And so he doesn't have any green on him either. So I'm going to give him a little bit of reflective light down here. So you can feel like, you know, the, the green's coming off the forest. A little bit of it in his hair. And again, it's not something you'll notice right away, but it will feel, the piece will feel more integrated rather than that gray thing that's on top of those red things. And the thing is, is that even with a, a fluffy coat like a koala has, you'll get a little bit of that. Okay, now the last thing we're going to do here is that chin of his is pink. And that's a little bit too heavy for me. So I'm going to blot it out. There. Much better. And that's nice too because it's almost like a bullseye. It takes it takes your uh, um, eye straight to his face. Put a little bit on the sides. A little in his coat. Just a little. Nothing that anybody's really going to notice. But it's just enough to give you an extra added feeling of warmth. Okay, I think just a little bit more blue. Yeah, that's too much. So we talk about okay, this has gotten wet. The the palette where the Prussian blue has gotten wet. So when I pulled out the mount on my palette, it's just way way too much. I want much lighter blue than that. So I'm mixing it in. Notice I'm mixing in all the dirty stuff with that too. It's going getting more of a blue green. I was like, okay, that's more or less what I wanted anyways. And I'm going to pull that, do a little bit of stippling with that. You have some blue shadows here. Shadows underneath the tree here. Right. Take a little bit of this, throw it into the leaves too. See if I can get them to turn a little more. We're just about done here. That's a little bit too heavy for me. I like that back. There we go. So the hands are standing out. And I need to paint the claws. And that's it. That's our little koala. And what I'll do too is once this is totally dry, um, you'll see there's a little bit of buckling to the paper, not much, but you want to leave that there until it's completely dry. So give it, you know, if you can give it overnight, it's best. Um, but if you want to get hot to it and you're, you're really anxious to work on the piece, give it at least an hour, you know, go get, go get a cup of coffee, give your friend a call, go through your Instagram account, come back, then you can pull it off or you can leave it there and, um, do additional um, pen work over the top. Now there's one little dot that I, you know, it's all by its lonesome there. I'm seeing, it's like, eh, I want to put 
put something in a couple there yeah that's a little bit better so it's not there's not like one dot there and maybe and that's it that's our koala actually let's say it's a little heavy there put too much green in that area i'm thinking so i'm going to scumble it away see i'm using my brush to scumble up the color underneath and you'll see the green's a bit of a dye color so it's it's kind of sticking there it doesn't want to come up but it's still gotten lighter than the uh, spots in the area around it so when this area totally dries it'll pull back again um and that's it that's our koala thank you for uh, stopping by again please subscribe and like i will have something else for you here at this station next week so um please stop by thank you very much for watching hope you enjoyed it